everybody's not here. And um, okay, so um, this is our first quiz of this session. Remember, I'm going to drop several. But I also said that this session's a little bit different from AMP1. If you're not getting this information, I don't see students make it after this, if they, when they struggle with this. You've got to get it as we go. So this is why I gave you an extra copy so that you can take it home with you. If you didn't do well on this, it's no big deal. It's not even going to hurt you. It's going to be your first drop, right? Um, not going to hurt you at all. But what you're going to do is this weekend when you're studying for this next one that you're going to have Tuesday along with the first lab quiz, right, that same morning, um, you're going to know how to study in case there was something that I had not communicated well, you know, about how to study for this because this is how you need to know this information. So list the four major tissue categories. They are epithelial, muscle, connective, and nerve, aren't they? A specialist who deals with issues related to hormone imbalances is called a endocrinologist. endocrinologist. TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone, and its function is to its, its function is to increase metabolism, and it does it by targeting the thyroid to release hormones that increase metabolism. So I know there might have been a lot of different ways you said that. And by the way, you, do, you try not to leave blanks because I give partial credit. You know, so ADH stand, excuse me, didn't ask for what it stands for. ADH targets the ADH. kidneys and its function is to, to, to increase blood pressure. Its, its function is to increase blood pressure. It does it by causing the kidneys to conserve water. Do you see the distinction and the question that's being asked? And those are the kind of things that get you on NCLEX questions and stuff. If you're not answering the question that's asked, okay? The ejection of milk from the mammary tissue is achieved by oxytocin. Nobody jumped on milk and wrote pro prolactin, did they? <laughs> Thanks for admitting it if you did. Because, again, I wasn't trying to trick you. I wrote, I asked the question, the ejection of milk, not the production of milk, right? So you do have to answer the questions that are asked, and the answer for that would have been oxytocin. And good, this is a learning experience, so you think, oh, I'm not going to do that again, and, and that's going to be great. So, okay, a hypersecretion of human growth hormone with the onset beginning in adulthood may lead to a condition known as? Acromegaly. Acromegaly. Ovulation is um, when? What is what is ovulation? It's the rupture of the follicle that's that's nurturing the egg. So it's the release of the egg from the follicle. That's what ovulation is. It's achieved by the release of what hormone? And if you put LH, I'm gonna, that's fine. But please know what LH stands for. What does it stand for? Luteinizing hormone. That's right. Would FSH be okay there? No. It wouldn't. Because the question is asking you how this event known as ovulation actually occurs. Right? Okay. ACH, ACTH targets adrenal glands. The pituitary is controlled by hormones released from? The hypothalamus. Diabetes insipidus is caused by ADH. a low or hypersecretion of what? ADH, ADH antidiuretic hormone. Hormones. Nobody saw diabetes and, and said anything about glucose, did you? I hope you didn't because you know diabetes just simply means you're peeing a lot. That's what that means. And you looked and you saw diabetes insipidus and you thought, no, that's because of a lack of <coughs> ADH. All right, so um, the bonus, I, maybe it wasn't fair, but I think it was fair because I spent some time on it. Name two gonadotropins. These are hormones that target travel to the gonads, and they are FSH and LH. FSH and LH. So, so guys, this is just the first quiz. The next quiz on Tuesday is going to look a whole lot like this. The questions are going to look a whole lot like this because these are how our quizzes are, right? Okay, these are how our quizzes are in this class. 
quizzes count a significant part of your grade in this class. So you really do need to, um, to, to figure out how to be up on this and how to learn the information in this type of way. Um, any questions for me? Yes. Gigantism, I put it above acclimatically. Is that childhood? Yeah. Oh, okay. See, see if, it, if the onset, yeah, and see, but thank, thank you guys for bringing it up because, again, you, there was a, a part in that question that told me that that wouldn't be gigantism. So you have to be really careful how you read the question because the onset is beginning in adulthood. So in adulthood, your seal plates are closed. I think you're the one who told me that was the seal plates are closed and you answered in class. Um, so you can't get any taller, can you? When that disorder starts, you can't get any taller. But it is going to affect other tissues. It's going to affect those irregular bones and even other tissues as well. Um, so, so good. How quickly um, do you, are they able to diagnose the gigantic um, it's it's usually you're going to be exhibiting signs. So, um, oh, you mean in childhood? Yeah, like, it actually, in oh, it can't gigantism. gigantism you talk about. Okay, so gigantism in childhood. Yeah, sometimes they really do. Like when they are seeing a child that is, you know, this is one of the reasons they chart. You know, uh, because they know in that blue area of the chart, this is where most fall. But of course, it's normal to have some people who are tall, and it's normal for some to fall below the chart. Height, weight, you know, whatever. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, don't you? We're not saying parts and, and pediatrics. But what they'll see um, with kids who have, who may have a hypersecretion of growth hormone, it's not really just going to be height. There's going to be some other things too that might be going on. Um, but height will be one of them. And they will actually look for, they'll usually rule out a hypersecretion of growth hormone. They'll usually also do a test for Marfan. Syndrome, they may even just be looking at Ehlers Danlos, you know, so they can build end up doing a battery of screens, and but one of them is hyperstreaming of growth hormone. Yeah, they get to be correct, but they don't get to be You know, on this type of thing, I try to be very lenient and phonetically correct. It's gonna, you know, I try to be lenient on this, and I treat everybody the same. So the reason, the way I go through this, because um, you know, I, have y'all, have y'all picked on the up on the fact that I really hate grading? <laughs> you know, I, I do because I know that I've been in classes where the grading was completely subjective, and I'm just going to let you know that that's an injustice. When you know that the grading is subjective, right? It's like those English papers and you just know that person just doesn't like you. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, or whatever, because you look at that somebody else's paper that looked just the same, or whatever. Um, that actually hasn't ever happened to me, but when it happened to other people, I feel for them so much that I take on the crusade. You know what I mean? And I think, well, you know, that test, that assessments, assessments need to be fair. They really need to be fair, and we need to bend, those of us that are doing assessments need to bend over backwards to make sure our tools are fair, and that our tools are accurately evaluating what we are assessing. Right? So let me say this. Before I do these quizzes, I look through quite a few of them. And if I, when I start to see a trend, like on a question, like one question, I'm seeing this trend, I'm thinking, okay, that's not them, that's me. That's the way I heard that question, but obviously it didn't make any sense. So um, I'll do that same thing with like spelling stuff. Now, let me say this, and I want everyone to hear me when I say this. If I would ask you, like on labs, and I think I've already told y'all that. On these labs, you will have you will not have word banks on any of your labs in this class, in this A and P section. You won't have word banks, and the spelling will count. So sometimes I pretty much I tell you spelling is going to count, and you all need to be working on your spelling. You really do. Um, I mean, I know that's but you really do need to try to always have it phonetically right. Um, but on some things, you really do need to have it. The thing about medicine and this language that we have in medicine and actually any of the sciences is that this is Latin derived. These, these names and these terms are, are mostly Latin or Greek derived. And the way that this is evolved is that sometimes there's two correct spellings. It's okay 
to have, uh, you know, the end in an A, E, or just an A. You know, you'll see it both ways. An example of that is something I just saw the other day. It's, it, does everybody know what a sty on the eye is? Do you know what that is? It's caused by a bacterium called Staphylococcus aureus. But styes can be spelled correctly, S-T-Y or S-T-Y-E. It's like, you know, either way is correct. But, but you can't be doing other stuff with it. Do you know what I mean with that word? You can't be like writing it any other way. Um, but okay. So I, I try to be leaning it a lot of the time. But um, if I've asked you, like especially with labs, to, to concentrate on your spelling, I really want you to, okay? Any other questions? That's a good question. Any other questions? All right, so today um, I have a couple of different things in lab. I think we'll finish up our endocrine chapter. It's amazing how much information is packed in this little chapter, isn't it? Um, we're going to finish up the lecture, though, on this, and you guys are going to be making sure that you're looking at your deeper insights at your disorders table at the end of the chapter. And in lab today, you should be able to finish your concept map with your organs, what hormones are under those, the hormones functions and the disorders. You should be able to finish that concept map. I would think since now you're gonna have all the organs, the 10 major organ systems, you're, you would take up a whole two tables of, of, of doing that and getting it right, playing with it. But I have another exercise too that you'll each do that I think that our students have told me has really helped them. So we have a couple of different things that we're gonna be doing. There's no real wet lab for these endocrine glands. This is why I, I ask you to please uh, look, at, look at as many pictures of those 10 major endocrine organs as you can. Look at them on cadavers, the pictures on the cadavers. Look at them in the illustrations. Your lab for the 10 major endocrine organs will be an illustration. It will not be a, um, a picture of cadaver parts okay so but look at a lot of different um pictures of those and, and make sure that you know where those 10 organs are situated where they're located okay so we're good to continue i think we stopped on i don't know where we stopped i really don't okay and melatonin thank you so we, we've gone with uh the I, I want I, this picture reminds me of something I want to um, I want you all to think about that it, and it hopefully it makes you know I keep saying I say that I found myself saying that and then it, that it makes good sense. Do I say that a lot? Okay, um, you notice that pictures repeat themselves, you know. But okay, anyway, the reason I say that a lot is because I want you to, as you're studying, make it make sense. Read it enough that you think, oh, I see the connection. That makes perfect sense, okay? So that's why I think I say that a lot. But anyway, we said that of course you need to know the names of the basic hormones, where they're from, what they target, where they, mean, where they go to if it's, if it's a specific location, like the gonadotropins, and then what they do when they get there. Of course you know that. But it, this picture reminds me of something I would like you to also realize. That even once they get there, even once they get to their target, we know that our target organs that they get to, like the gonads, are going to have to have cells that have very special receptors embedded in their membranes that recognize them when they get there. Right? Because if a cell gets a targeted hormone coming to it, and it doesn't have a receptor that recognizes the hormone, is anything gonna happen? Nothing is gonna happen. Nothing. Does everybody understand that? So when we think, does that make sense? <laughs> does it, okay? Yeah, so when, um, sorry, I'm gonna look for something. I don't know the page number, but I'm not um, you know darn well, I could actually just look it up in the index and I can have a better idea of what it's here. Um, so what I want you to know is whenever there are endocrine disorders, 
whenever there's an endocrine disorder, is it always just because the, the origin, the gland is not releasing that hormone? No. It could be because it's releasing too much of the hormone. Is it always because um, that gland is not getting the signal to release that hormone? Maybe not. Maybe it's the hyper, maybe it's the hypothalamus that's the problem. But it's sometimes actually the target sites. The target sites don't have receptors on their cells that are allowing the hormone to come in and cause the reaction it's supposed to have. Does that make sense? All right. So, uh, you know what really, oh my God, it's going to All right. I will get it. I'll use the, the index. I really will. I'll use this. I want y'all, if you have a book, get your book out. And if you have a book, you can share it with somebody who doesn't have a book. Okay. No, y'all are right. I don't know what horseshoes is. It's an old period day. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, on page the, in this book, it's ten thirty six. Uh, it's a sixth edition. It's a sixth edition, but it's a picture that looks like this. So it is in the it is in chapter twenty seven. Right? It's in the new edition too. But I'm gonna walk this around. But I want y'all to see this picture of these three siblings. Do you see them? This this is a picture of three siblings. Y'all see it? What page is that? That's new book. 1027, 1027 for y'all's edition, 1027. <coughs> I want you to see this picture of three siblings, and if you just looked at this picture of these three siblings, you would say their genders are, they're not, they're males. They're males. Do you see them? Everybody's got this picture. You know why? It's not because they're not producing testosterone. They are producing testosterone, like men do. But their cells, their tissues don't have the receptors on them to bring it in. Do you get what I'm saying? So that can cause serious issues. These, these three siblings would certainly have been raised female when they have, mm -hmm. but they do not have um, ovaries. And they do not have fallopian tubes, and they do not have that. Do you get what I'm saying? So please understand that uh, endocrine, this is what I tell people too, please understand that endocrinologists are worth going to see if you have any kind of, any kind of hormone um, problem other than <laughs> something very, very easy, like an easy diagnosis and it's just the one hormone problem. A lot of times though when people do have hormone issues, they usually have more than one. And you know what? That's when you need a primary care provider that they'll rework their weight in gold that know their limitations. And they tell you, uh, you know what, you have now something that's more than just this one basic thing like diabetes mellitus, and I think you need to see an, an endocrinologist. Because they don't know the newest best, if, you know, the newest information coming out. They won't know the newest trials for medication, the newest data but hopefully the specialist will. And you can see how tricky endocrine problems can be. It's not always just the origin that's the problem. It's not, you don't always know where the imbalance is, and you might not know something like this. You get what I mean? The receptors. So anyway, I just thought I would reinforce that idea that endocrine issues can, I mean, let me just, they're not usually very, very complicated, but they can be. And so if somebody certainly has more than one endocrine issue, I think they need an endocrinologist. I would say that. You know, they do. All right. So um, the pineal gland we stuck on. So the next one, I think, is the thymus, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I think he was just breathing. No. No. Um, all right. Um, you know, I was so excited when I got these new pictures from the new book. And stuff. Now I'm thinking, ha, ah, it's too many. So sometimes it's too much. It's, uh, but, but do try to look at pictures and, and highlights and everything that you can um, to see. I want to let you know that the thymus, this and, and these illustrations, I think, are sometimes so much easier for us to see uh, as a foundation. 
the thymus gland is said to be mediastinum. And what that means, it's located, mediastinum. And what that means is right here in the middle thoracic region here. So uh, this is kind of where it is. As a smaller child, it's huge. Do y'all see how huge this is? But as we age, so you can tell it's a bigger person. As we age, what happens to it? Well, oh well, that was a good thought, but uh, yeah. this is, you know, just yeah. proportion. Right. Okay, Nicole, that's a good thought. <laughs> but actually, it's also it's actually really involuting too. It, that's still happening a little, but it's also involuting. It's involuting, and it does that naturally. It's normal. It's part of, of the growth process. And when I tell you what it does, maybe this will make sense for you. You know, when we're a fetus, we're in this amniotic sac that is protected from anything that's foreign. You know, it's not completely protected because, you know, sometimes <coughs> bad things happen uh, and things can get through. But we're essentially protected until the amniotic sac breaks, water breaks, right? And then there's this introduction to the fetus <coughs> of the, the mom's vaginal microbes. They're the first real foreign things this fetus is being introduced to. And because now there's this opening. And so the fetus's thymus plays a huge role and what it's releasing and what they're targeting, the hormones it's releasing and what they're targeting, to teach and train <laughs> a special type of your white blood cells to recognize foreign things, like all the microbes that we live in this world with, right? So, and that begins, you know, in a typical situation when the water breaks, when the amniotic sac breaks, and you're being introduced, and the thymus is ready, hopefully because you reach full gestation, the thymus is ready to, to, to send all those little white cells to school so that, so that you learn what's foreign, but you learn also what's part of your ecosystem. So when you are really little, you're, everything's new, isn't it? Your thymus is having to do a lot of work because everything's new. Everything in your ecosystem is new and foreign, right? And the thymus is amazing. Let me tell you what it secretes, and your book's gonna name a few, but I want you to know them. They're called thymusins. The thymus gland releases hormones called thymusins. Thymusins. These hormones called thymusins target, target, and I just want you to know thymusins as a group. These hormones target a special type of white blood cell known as T lymphocytes. T lymphocytes. Please know, this doesn't say lymphocyte up here, but it says if they are special T lymphocytes. The reason we call them T lymphocytes is because they depend on hormones from where? The thymus. That's why we call them T lymphocytes. And maybe you'll take my word as the foundation for what we're going to do in a couple of chapters from now, our immunology chapter. You'll take my word for it that T lymphocytes are vital for your survival in this foreign world. Do you hear me? Let me tell you how important it is. If an infant doesn't have a functioning thymus, those infants, they, they figured it out really quickly because they get sick really quickly. They have to be put in a bubble. They have forever. They would have, now, back in the day, before these sterile bubbles were created, they died. But now they get put in a bubble. All their food, all their liquids are sterilized before they come into their little bubble. They can never have human touch because humans have what? Microbes, germs, microbes. So they will be put in a bubble. There's no um, medicines for that? Okay, so with st there's no medicines that could get them out of the bubble that they wouldn't die in a very short order after. But with stem cell replacement, genetic engineering stem cell replacement, the very first bubble babies have been have gotten out successfully. 
So whatever you might think about stem cell issues or whatever, this, this has been very effective in treating some very outrageous kind of disorders that we know that, would, that people would have never survived before. Are there risks to it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it kind of new science? Yeah, but they would have been in the bubble otherwise. Many of the ones in the past that have been children that have been babies that have been placed in bubbles and had been, you know, raised in the bubbles for a certain amount of months and or years, uh, you know, they didn't live long because mo many of them would end up coming, making a choice to come out and then they wouldn't live long. So do we need our thymus? What does it release? A group. I don't want to, I don't care. You know, yes, they're called thymus sins group. Is collectively referred to as that. And what do they target, these hormones? T lymphocytes, which are a special type of what? White blood cell. That does what for us? Protects us. Are we good? Do we know what the thymus gland does? You have a question, Nicole? As an adult, does it ever stop? Okay. So you're wondering why it's in blue. Okay. Because. Once you have lived in your ecosystem long enough, you know, you've been exposed to most of the things in your ecosystem. So it's starting to involute. Did you all know that for most, most uh, infectious processes or microbes that live in our environment, for most of them, we can't get sick from them but once because our thymus our thymus does what it's supposed to do, the T lymphocytes do what they're supposed to do, and you don't get things again. So this is why kids, you know, they have snotty nose kids, sorry, that I love so much. <laughs> so not, but you know, they are snotty nose, aren't they? And that's normal. That's natural. That should be happening. Can kids be sick if they live in too clean of an environment? Yes. Yes, they can. So kids have on average in, in houses that are average, not the ones that are unsafe because they're, they're that unclean, and not the ones that are unsafe because they're too clean. But the average child is gonna have about 12 colds a year. Now you might be thinking to yourself, they don't have that many colds a year. Yes they do, it's just that some of them don't make them stop skipping and jumping. They still have a little bit of a snotty nose. And that's why I call them snotty nose kids, because almost all the time kids have a runny nose. And that's healthy. That's okay. But adults have about four. An average adult would have four. Why wouldn't an adult have more? Because they've already had them. They've already been exposed to them. And they're not getting them again. So, you know, as we get used to our ecosystems, we, our thymus starts to end the loop. Now, here's the deal. Like, senior citizens... Senior citizens, older people, our thymus is not only involuted, it's kind of not functioning. And when it's the organ, I, I mean, not, not, not completely functioning, but as we age, the thymus involutes so much that it's actually getting replaced by adipose because that's what happens to tissues that aren't being used. Typically, they're going to be replaced by adipose. So with that being said, who do you think is most, what groups, what age groups do you think are the most at risk for diseases? Geriatrics for sure. I didn't, I said senior, not geriatric. <laughs> Geriatrics for sure. And then what? And then little ones because they're being so challenged, right? So little ones and older. And that, you know, that makes sense, doesn't it? So, okay. All right. So we see lots of pictures of the thymus where it was, where it should be located, so y'all will know where to locate it. And I'm gonna tell you something. Okay, okay, that's fine. That's fine. I thought I was I thought that something was out of order, but I'm good. All right, now, guys, the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is here at the base of the neck. Okay. What was right here? But this is the thyroid up here at the base of the neck. This thyroid gland, um, this thyroid gland is we already know something about it. We know that it's not going to do a certain thing until it gets a signal to. Where, what is that signal? Uh, TSH, TSH mm -hmm. thyroid stimulating hormone. And where is that coming from? Thyroid stimulating hormone was coming from where? 
Do you see why you have to know things as we go? Because we'll start to build, right? All right, so thyroid, the thyroid gland, when TSH turns it on, the thyroid gland is going to secrete, is going to secrete, you see the cadaver here, you see this cadaver's neck, you all see this, and so you see this gland is like highlighted for you. Um, when TSH gets here to this thyroid, it is going to cause the thyroid gland to secrete two um, hormones. That it is thyroxine, which is called T4, and uh, triodothyronine, which is called T3. You see why they're called T4 and T3, because it's just easier to say those names. But actually, what I want you to really know what the three and the four stand for is I want you to know that they're called that because T3 has three atoms of iodine that's needed to make it. How many atoms of iodine do you think T4 needs? Exactly. Okay. So thyroxine and triodothyronine. Now, let me tell you what happens when these get released from the thyroid gland. These two hormones that y'all are going to know from the thyroid, T3 and T4, I want you to know that they get released into the bloodstream and they have widespread effects. Widespread. That means throughout the body, right? And what they're going to do is give signals to your cells to amp up production, to increase metabolism. Are we good with this? T3 and T4 have widespread effects throughout the body that causes cells to amp up their cellular processes, their metabolism. Amp up production. I talk about cells as being factories. And when we were looking at cell uh, biology, we saw that they really are little factories, aren't they? And the rate of their production is controlled by T3 and T4. How quickly they're going to be producing is going to be controlled by these hormones. So if somebody has a metabolism problem, oh, it must be T3 and T4. No, Madeline? Madeline's saying maybe it's not T3 and T4. It might be what? Well, it can have some issues with receptor cells, but but it's usually for this particular disorder, it's either T3 or T4, or it might be that you're not making TSH, right? Or it might be that the pituitary gland to release TSH is not getting the signal to, and then that would be a what problem? Hypothalamus problem. Are you get are you with me? So when you hear about an endocrine disorder, you have to understand the layers of what it takes to get to the hormones. And that's what I meant about the complexity, you know, and, and, and so you just have to really give it that some thought. So let me say this to you. If you have your metabolism is going down, because does metabolism stay the same at any given time? No, of course it doesn't. We're talking about metabolism now, set points. And metabolism will come up, and then the nervous system gets a signal for that, and thinks, okay, I'm going to send a signal for this to kind of slow back down and stay within what? Through what kind of feedback? Exactly. So as, as metabolism is getting low, what do you think your TSH levels are going to start doing? Do you understand that? Your TSH levels are going to start going up. Because if the TSH levels are going up, it should do what to your metabolism? Bring it back up. You get what I mean? All right. Okay. So what you just told me is that you understand if somebody is hypothyroid, if they can't make T3 and T4 for whatever reasons, what would be a diagnostic test result for TSH? If they are hypothyroid, they're not making T3 and T4, what would be a diagnostic TSH level? If their metabolism is low, because they're not making T3 and T4, what should the TSH be doing? 
It should be high. It, sh it will be. It's the diagnostic <laughs> test of hypothyroidism is a high TSH. Do you get it? Because TSH is going to be, your pituitary doesn't know your thyroid can't work. Your pituitary is going to be saying, sending out TSH, trying to get your thyroid to work. So T3 and T4 work together to increase the metabolism, not like, does anything make it go back to the front? Uh, and the negative feedback? Does it make it go back down at all? Or is that just like a, hey? It's so, so metabolism is getting normal high. The, the, the cells are producing. The nervous system is detecting. Okay, metabolism is pretty good now. <laughs> okay. You know, because when metabolism is getting higher, you're using more calories. <coughs> is it taking calories to work? <coughs> calories to work, right? Is your temperature even being affected by it? It's going up. The nervous system's going to detect all that, send a signal through the hypothalamus to tell the hypothalamus to stop the TSH. Okay. The TSH levels go down, and when the TSH levels go down, the T3 and T4 are going to start to go down. You get what I'm saying? That's in a normal situation. But if, it, if you are hypothyroid, meaning that your thyroid gland is not working, not producing T3 and T4, the diagnostic test for it is a high TSH level. Because TSH is coming, trying to get it to work. And you're producing more and more TSH, and it's not working. And the TSH level is getting higher and higher and higher. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. And does it make sense? <laughs> does it? Doesn't it? If you think about that, that makes, okay, I get that this affects this, and this is what was going to be released if you have a low metabolism. Your pituitary is going to be trying to make your thyroid work by producing TSH, and it's just going to keep pumping out TSH and pumping out TSH, and that's going to be the diagnostic test for hypothyroidism is a high TSH level. All right, now. These hormones can be synthetic re synthetically replaced <coughs> by a, and this is, it's man-made, so when I say synthetically, by a, horm a hormone called Synthroid. Synthroid? Synthroid. Synthroid. Uh, that's, the, that's the name, but the actual, the actual molecule is Lidothyroxine. You don't need to, I'm not going to ask you about Synthroid or Lidothyroxine. But I'm just telling you, if you're the, if you got know somebody that's hypothyroid, how many of you know people hypothyroid? All of you know somebody hypothyroid. I don't hypothyroid. I've, had, I've been since I was 30 years old. I had an autoimmune disease that attacked my thyroid. For like <coughs> one in eight women by the time they're 30, one in eight. That's a lot. Had this this hypothyroid. And you do need to know it. It's coming up in your notes, but you need to know it. This autoimmune disease is called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's an autoimmune disease, which means what happened? You're by the thyroid thyroid thyroid. Thyroid. That my own immune system started attacking my thyroid gland, the cells that actually produce T3 and T4. So those numbers started to drop, T3 and T4. <coughs> so what happened to my metabolism? It started to drop. So what did my pituitary do in response? Tried to push out more TSH, saying, wait a minute, <laughs> you need to be working. And so TSH levels were sky high. And that told me I was hypothyroid. Now, one in eight women, uh, the reason you need to know this is that it's so very common. This is a very, very common adult onset hypothyroidism. And by the way, it can actually happen in children too. <coughs> yes. How does it affect men? Does it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I said it in What's women. There? I said in women because it's so common in women. But it can affect men. And I'm actually thinking of a young boy who was not so young now, but he was diagnosed as a teenager with Hashimoto's. Is there a ratio for that as well, or just a, it's a a lot less common. It's a lot less common in men. You, you all know that most autoimmune diseases, uh, most autoimmune diseases are more prevalent in women. <clears throat> but but men have them too. So please don't don't close your mind off to that. Men have them too, but they're just it's most of them are more common in women. Yes. 
So having like a high TSH level, um, can that affect like other things in the body? Um, so because it's just flowing through you. It's, it is flowing through you, and not that we know of. But this is what I mean about endocrinology. We are just in the beginning of understanding all of this. Every single day, there's new information about hormones we know, like TSH, that we find out are doing other things. What we know that um, what we know that it does though to the thyroid is it causes the thyroid. This is like knocking at the thyroid's door. It causes the thyroid to enlarge, and that causes a goiter. A goiter is simply a word that's used for an enlarged thyroid gland. It's not diagnostic, but it just means your thyroid gland's enlarged. So in this case, with Hashimoto's, it's because of that high TSH level. That, that TSH is causing that to enlarge. Okay. Um, now, <coughs> there are other reasons for goiters, though. There are other reasons for enlarged thyroid as well, and I'm going to talk about those, too. I'll talk about one right now. One is so one goiter, one enlarged thyroid can be because your hypothyroid and TSH levels are high. And the TSH level is trying to get that thyroid gland to work and it's not. And so as soon as you take Synthroid, a live peroxin, the TSH levels go back to normal. That's how they know when they've got they've got you on the right dose of Synthroid, is that your TSH levels are now back in normal range. Now with Hashimoto's, is that like you're just enlarging? So I was lucky. I didn't have any signs and symptoms of it. it this so all that was really hard to like catch. The, what we, you know, most autoimmune diseases come on chronically. So it, you know, because it's so slow that it's they usually aren't diagnosed correctly for a while. Uh, but some can come on kind of rapidly. This is one that usually is kind of slow. So some women might be thinking. Oh, they told me this was going to happen when I was 30. When I was 30, I weighed 120 pounds, around three miles a day. I never, I, I never missed weight. You know, I, I was 12. But that was the year, y'all are going to think it was. That was the year that the ear thermometers came out. Now they have, but anyway, that was brand new, the ear thermometer. UVA was the testing site. And so we were always the guinea pigs, the employees. So every day they would come around like do you know testing these ear these new ear thermometers. And Barbara Post was on that research thing like that. And she said, you know, you've had a fever every day this week. I said, what? I have not. And she said, yes, you have. He said, you have had. I mean, she said, let me give you your lymph notes. And so she said, your lymph notes are fine with your thyroid's March. I said, what? You know, because I was perfectly healthy. Um, so I had no symptoms yet. And it probably would have taken me a few years to start seeing the symptoms, but I just called it early. You see what I'm saying? And it wasn't really enlarged. You had to really complicate it to feel that it was enlarged, but it was, I couldn't feel that it was enlarged, but she did. She thought she did, and so I tested it. Um, so anyway, so I've been on Synthroid for 30 years, and um, it's no big deal to take one a day. I, I really, don't I mean I rarely take Advil, so I really don't like the thought of that. But I understood. I understood if I didn't take it. Let's see. I was going to start gaining weight, which I did anyway, and that had nothing to do with my thyroid plan. But anyway, um, I I was going to start gaining weight. I was probably going to have skin and hair. And I mean, you get slow, you slow down. And so some women, I've known some people who've gotten diagnosed with Hashimoto's. Because they were having a hard time just kind of concentrating, um, and, they, and it, they were noticing it, and so they figured that out. So I've known some people who come in because they have seen skin and hair issues, um, or weight gain, or you know, tired, just lethargic all the time. They and they didn't change their diets, so their calorie intake didn't go up. But because they weren't using the calories, their weight gain went up. The weight gain went up. Yeah. All right, so Hashimoto's is the hyposecretion of it. Is there hypersecretion? Okay. Of it? And there is, and so I was going to tell you one other, but I'll talk about this one. There's a hypersecretion that's autoimmune. So this is autoimmune too. It's called Graves' disease. Have you all heard of Graves' disease? Mm -hmm. So this is a low secretion. A high secretion is called Graves' disease. And this, this is usually more of a rapid onset these are both autoimmune this is usually more of a rapid onset 
And um, what happens with Graves' disease is that you end up producing an antibody, because autoimmune, the, the immune system, right? That looks just like TSH. So your thyroid gland that's waiting to get a signal from TSH thinks it's getting a signal. They think that's TSH, but it's not TSH acting on those receptors. What is it? An antibody your immune system produced that looked like it, that mimic it. And so your, your metabolism starts to go way up. So now when your metabolism is staying way up, what are, you, what are some of your signs and symptoms? Then you're like going crack. Well, maybe not twice that much, but, but maybe lose weight, not being able to sleep, not being able to sleep, being just a little bit, you know, it can be some of these things. If you know your diet can really change too much, you are hungry, you're, you're just, it, it can change, it can affect a lot of things. It can still affect skin and hair. It can affect a lot of different things. It can affect your eyes. Some people have what's called exothelitis, <laughs> and this is when the eyes start to bulge. You know, they start to bulge out. So this is this leads to what, and again, the thyroid gland is working so hard that it enlarges because it's working so hard. Now, this is called a toxic goiter. A toxic goiter is the diagnosis for Graves' disease. Now, how they would diagnose that is, again, by doing special blood tests and uh, looking at these antibodies. You don't have to know all that. Just know that Graves' disease is a hypersecretion of those thyroid hormones. And again, one of the signs may be a what? A goiter, right? But it, it, this is a toxic goiter. There's another type of goiter. I want you all to write this down. It's called an endemic goiter. An endemic goiter. And an endemic goiter is going to be a goiter that is going to be because um, endemic endemic means because of something in the environment. Endemic goiter is going to be a goiter that you have because there's no iodine in your diet, a lack of iodine. So endemic goiters are indicating a lack of iodine. If you don't have iodine in your diet, what can you not make? And so if you can't make them, guess what? Metabolism is going to be low. And guess what TSH levels are going to be? High. And you're going to realize you don't have iodine. Now, in our country, we take so much for granted, but in our country, we rarely see this anymore. The reason we rarely see it is why? Because iodine has been included to salt. It's been salt, you know, it says iodine, iodine is in salt. And our foods are so salty. But there's still some areas in our country where people are self sufficient and they're uh, self sustaining farms and whatnot. And if there wasn't enough iodine in the soil when they're raising their crops or their animals are eating, but, you know, hay, grass is on the so if there's not enough, you'll see it in these little pockets of, of these areas where people are not bringing in, you know, foods from other areas or not eating pre-processed packaged foods. Um, and so, so every now and then we'll see an endemic order here, but it's much more common in other countries now because we do have so much salt, so much iodine and more salt. So that, those are three different reasons you might have a large Thyroid, correct? All right. So, any questions for me? We know what Hashimoto's is, the hyposecretion of the thyroid hormones or metabolism. We know what Graves' disease is. It's an increase, it's a hypersecretion. And we know what endemic goiter means. It means you don't have iodine. We'll take a break in just a minute. Um, so, guys, I want you to know another hormone from the thyroid that y'all learned in BNP1. And it is called calcitonin. <clears throat> calcitonin, now I want you to be careful how you read this because this is whatever. But what calcitonin does is decrease blood calcium levels. That's its function. It decreases blood calcium levels. So what would be the stimulus for its release? When they're high, right? Does that make sense for you? To you? So let's pretend this is the calcium negative feedback now. And so when calcium is starting to get high, 
in the bloodstream, we need it to come back down, don't we? Yes. So we need it to come back down, and so what we use to create calcitonin. calcitonin. And y'all remember, calcitonin functions, one of the ways it functions is by targeting osteoblast. What did y'all say an osteoblast is? Blast means early, the early what cell? So if you are target, calcitonin targets these stem cells that become osteoblasts, this will become an osteocyte, which means what? Now it's a mature bone, but to make bone, what is bone made of? Mostly. And so as you're pulling calcium out of the bloodstream to make bone, what is happening to blood calcium levels? Exactly. Okay, so calcitonin. All right, now, now, uh, that's some histology that you guys could look at, and I want to talk about one more thing, and then we're going to take a quick break. You guys, behind, this is a posterior view of the thyroid gland. You see this thyroid gland? And this is the trachea, so if, if y'all were looking at me from the back and you could see, you would see that they, they, this little thing wrapped around here, this trachea. If you look, so this is the thyroid gland, a posterior view. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. There are four tiny little glands called parathyroid glands. They're called parathyroid glands because they're near, next to, neighboring, beside the thyroid. But do you see these four tiny little glands? Will you know how to label them? Will you know what view you should be looking at to label them? Because can you see them from the front? Can you see them from the side? You can only see them from the okay. So all right, so that's where you're looking for them, and they're, they're tiny. These parathyroid glands release a hormone called parathyroid hormone. So that's their hormone that they release, and parathyroid hormone functions in several different ways. I mean, it's going to target several different things. So I do want you know because it does do some specifically. I do want you to know some specific targets, but let me tell you one of the things it targets. One of the things it targets is the kidneys so that you don't lose calcium. You keep it into urine. You pull it back into the bloodstream. What's that going to do to blood calcium? Increase it. So it tar if, if parathyroid hormone is circulating through the system, the kidneys are going to have a signal, oh, I'm saving calcium. That doesn't get to go to the urine, right? If parathyroid hormone is circulating in your digestive tract, your small intestines, anytime calcium's there, they're going to pull it in. So as long as you're eating enough calcium, it will be absorbed. Oh, are you saying that you could be eating a lot of calcium until the cows come home? No, I'm going to milk. Until the cows come home and it just go right through you? Because if you don't have parathyroid hormone, targeting those intestinal cells, it's not going to be absorbed. So are you telling me that there are hormones that dictate what kind of nutrients you absorb? Yeah. This is one of them. Parathyroid hormone dictates calcium being pulled in. And the intestines is going to pull it in. And the kidneys, they're going to conserve calcium. That's going to do what to blood calcium levels? Right. Bring them up. But one of the major ways it raises blood calcium levels is that it's going to target bone. And when it targets bone, I want you all to see this bone resorption. What this really means is that it's going to target a special kind of cell called osteoclast. Y'all remember osteoclast? Osteoclasts are special bone cells that dissolve bone. So they're actually like, Whatever. So they're dissolving bone. And when bone is dissolved, what did you tell me it's made of? Mostly, mostly calcium. Where's that calcium going to be released to? The bloodstream. All of those things together start to raise blood calcium levels. All of those things together. So parathyroid's function is to raise blood calcium levels. I want you to know that this is why. When someone has renal calculi, what is a renal calculi? What do we call those? We call them kidney stones. Make sure you know their real name are renal calculi, kidney stones. 
when someone has kidney stones repeatedly, maybe not just the first one, maybe not even the second one, they do try to get you to, pack, to catch it. If you don't pass it, you know, in the ER or whatever. They try to get you to catch it because they want to see what it's mostly made of. But when somebody has recurring kidney stones and they are predominantly calcium-based, do they worry that that person might be hyperparathyroid? Mm -hmm. Yes. And if somebody is hyperparathyroid, we not only worry about maybe kidney stones occurring because there's so much calcium being pulled back in that it crystallizes, you know, it, as it's being pulled back in. We also worry about bone health. Why would that be? Because your resort, the resorption of bone, you're breaking down bone if you're hyperparathyroid. And could you end up having uh, a problem with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we look at those things. <coughs> Are you good? Uh, all right, now, one thing, and we'll take a 10 minute break. So you guys understand, we just talked about calcitonin that does what to blood calcium? And we just talked about the hormone that raises it. Which one was that? So in other words, we talked about calcium what? Homeostasis. And we, what we get that whenever something comes up, we're going to have to have a way to bring it back down, right? So these hormones are considered to be antagonistic hormones. Meaning that one will do the opposite of the other. Do you go with that? Mm -hmm. So we're going to see some hormones that are synergistic. What would that mean? Do the same thing. They're doing the same thing. And then we're going to see some that are, like this, that are antagonistic. And we would hope for that. Because we know homeostasis is mostly maintained to what kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. And we know that when something does go up, it's going to need to eventually come back down. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we understand for any of these parameters, we're going to have one that's going to be raising something and another one that's going to be needed to lower it when it needs to be lowered. Are we good? Mm -hmm. So know those terms, synergistic or antagonistic. Um, and, and, and just realize when you're looking at something, like even in your concept mapping of these, these terms that you have, you'll see something that says that it raises blood pressure. But there are going to be quite a few hormones that raise blood pressure. So you could put it at three or four different ones because those hormones are what for blood pressure? Synergistic, right? How do you feel? Good. We're going to continue in 10 minutes. See what happens. Okay, take a break. Go up and down. Do something. I'm going to go get them. We're going to definitely do that for anybody who wants that. For um, letting me know about the recording yesterday. I had it up, but I hadn't clicked a button to make it available. because um, All right. So parathyroid glands, we're see, we saw those. We see what they do, how important they are. Now we're at the adrenal glands. And if we remember... We've already heard of these glands, these adrenal glands. We know where they're sitting because of their name. Renal means kidneys. Adrenal means superior to the kidneys. So they're sitting up kind of on top of the kidneys, almost like a little hat, aren't they? You know, you see? They're just sitting up on top of the kidneys there. Uh, these adrenal glands. So we already know about a hormone that targets them. What was that? ACTH from the from the pituitary right so ACTH from the pituitary so there are going to be some hormones in your textbook is gonna have kind of they talk about it a little bit differently but I'm gonna give you the list of what I want you to know for these hormones when we think about these adrenal glands if we were to do a dissection of them if we were to do a cut do you see this little cut right here of the outer edge the outer edge, the cortex, if we were to do a cut and blow it up and look at it under, under the microscope, histology, they would look like there would be distinct kind of layers of that cortex. This is all FYI, all FYI. These layers are actually called zones of the adrenal <coughs> cortex, and each of them actually do release certain different products. And that's why they look differently, because they have different function. And structure does dictate function. 
But anyway, so these zones that we're looking at, you're not going to have to know which zone does what. I just want you to know that. Now, the middle part we call the medulla, didn't we? We said this is the medulla, and it's going to release something different too. Now, here's what I want you to know about the adrenal medulla. It is nerve innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. And what did y'all tell me you already know about the sympathetic nervous system? It gives us our what kind of response? Fight or flight response. So what I want you to know is that um, when we think about the release of these particular hormones, the, the group is referred to as catecholamines. These are called, cat. the group is called catecholamines. But I've given you particular names for them. And that the main one that we think about is this group called epinephrine and norepinephrine. Sometimes you'll see epi and you'll see nor in parentheses, ephrine. But anyway, epi and norepinephrine. Epi and norepinephrine. And they are the ones that are going to give us this fight or flight kinds of reactions. And when we say that, that means they're going to target what areas? Like what might be targeted? <laughs> Your heart? So, so rate, the heart rate, meaning the heart rate's going to go up or down? It's going to go up. Heart, so heart rate, beats per minute, are going to go up. And then what else you say? Breathing. So your, breath, your respirations are going to increase. Respirations are going to increase. What else? Blood pressure. Blood pressure, really? This is going to make blood pressure go up? How does it do it? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah, but okay, how it does it is by epinephrine, norepinephrine, they target the muscle around blood vessels, causing the vessels to do what? Constrict. And when the vessels constrict, the volume did change inside, so the pressure changed. It went up. Do you get that? The, do, do, does everybody get that? Do we have to be able to explain that? So epinephrine, norepinephrine, they target the muscle in the heart, the myocardium, to be faster. And to be harder. How many of you have ever really truly been afraid? Like where you felt like your heart was going to beat out of your chest. Mm -hmm. Afraid. It was not only being faster. It was being harder, wasn't it? That's what this is. Now you couldn't feel your blood vessels constricting. But as they were constricting, what was happening to the pressure inside? And what that does, the heart rate beating more often and beating harder and the vessels constricting means that blood is going to flow faster. All of those three things combined make the blood be flowing faster. <laughs> right? So, but, you, but you get what I'm saying. It's made, and that's a good thing because blood is taking oxygen to these big muscles, the glutes, uh, whether you're going to fight or not, and you are going to maybe have to use them. You're going to maybe have to use them to lift that car off of your baby. You know how you've heard that people have done that kind of thing? Or run, or to stay in fight. Some people are so affected by this that they, uh, they get such a rush so quick, they freeze. That can happen too. That actually can happen too. So, uh, you know, usually that's just unique to who the person is. They say the best soldiers are the ones that run forward, don't freeze. They, they, they immediately, their, their innate response is going forward, not freezing or running. <laughs> you know, what'd you say? It happened to my cousin. He was out hunting. Yes. And he, he got down, yeah. He got down and was a bear, like, from the beginning, you know? Mm -hmm. And all we could think about was the high bar nine he had in his pocket. <laughs> you gave it the honey bun? Yeah, and he didn't think about it. Now. <laughs> that's, that's a funny story. <laughs> so he's okay. Well, he, okay, okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, so that fight, flight, or freeze is is from that rush of this, right? It's not always it's not always going to be released in such a quick response. You know, when you had that kind of response, you guys, it took a microsecond, didn't it? It didn't even take a full Mississippi one for you to feel like that, did it? It can happen quickly. But it can this this sympathetic nervous system can also be engaged in a slower kind of way too. Um, but either way, it's protected. 
it's protective and it's necessary for a lot of our functions. It really is. It's necessary for survival. Um, now, when we talk about the cortex, okay, so the cortex. Now, now look, guys, there are a ton of hormones, but we get the basics, right? So I'm going to tell you about the ones that I want you to know. When, you, when I told you about catecholamines being the epipharmonephrine and dopamine, and dopamine's going to have, a, have uh, so, some helpful effects as well to kind of get through these situations. But, but what I wanted to tell you is that um, these corticosteroids, this group, I want to give you some particular names of ones, and you're going to want to know their names, okay? So I want you to know about, uh, and I don't know what their name is, but I want you to know about one called... Uh, aldosterone, and I don't know where it is, but anyway, it's, it's got to be in there somewhere. So anyway, there's one called aldosterone. I'll do write that down. That's one of the mineral corticoids, but it's called aldosterone. So you're going to need to know aldosterone. Where is it from? The adrenal, the adrenal glands. And I'm going to want you to know that it targets the kidneys. You're going to have to know all the details about aldosterone. It's from the adrenal glands. It's going to target the kidneys. Does it have very far to go? No. No, they're sitting right on top of the kidneys. So, so no, it doesn't have very far to go. It's going to be in the bloodstream there and get to the kidneys. And when it gets to the kidneys, let me tell you what it's going to do. It's going to target a particular area of the kidneys to pull sodium back into your bloodstream. Sodium. Did we say sodium is an important electrolyte? Mm -hmm. It's got a positive charge, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And what we know about sodium, because of the way it is, water follows it. So when, when sodium's being pulled back into the bloodstream and keep being kept in the bloodstream, what is staying in the bloodstream too? Water. water. So what's happening to blood volume? It's, a, it's increased or it's staying up, isn't it? So what does aldosterone do to blood pressure? It raises it. So, you know, a synergistic hormone to aldosterone. What was a synergistic hormone to aldosterone? What'd you say? Y'all have already learned about a hormone that raises blood pressure. Which one was it? PTH doesn't do anything for blood pressure. It's ADH. It's ADH. Do y'all get that if you waited to the last minute to study for this test, if you didn't have quizzes, and if you waited, that you wouldn't know it. <laughs> you, would, you know, and I wouldn't either. I wouldn't know either. Unless I were being made to step, you've got to learn these as you go. Okay? All right. So uh, it's ADH. ADH raises blood pressure, and now we have aldosterone that raises blood pressure, and we know exactly how aldosterone does it. We say we said aldosterone is targeting the kidneys to pull sodium back in. And by the way, sodium has a positive charge. It's an ion has a positive charge. Do y'all know another important electrolyte that has a positive charge? Potassium. Potassium, Andrea. Yes. So if sodium's <laughs> being pulled back in and it's positive, where do you think potassium might be doing? I don't know. It's going out. So you're losing potassium. So if you had a hyper secretion of aldosterone, you might have a low level of what? Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. So, um, so are we good with this? Are we good with this? I also want you to know about, I, I don't know where they are in here. I want you to know about one that is called, really, really, I want, I want you to know about one that is actually called um, cortisol. 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 Y'all have heard of cortisol, haven't you? Cortisol is going to be released from the adrenal cortex, from the adrenal glands, in times of stress. But we said this is when the adrenal glands get released. Get stimulated, don't they? Mm -hmm. So in times of stress, it's going to be released because, it, you, by the way, cortisol gets released on a daily basis in a normal life. Because in a normal life, on a daily basis, do we get exposed to stress? Yes. We do. And we're so, hey, guess what? It's normal to feel <laughs> stress. It's normal to feel anxiety. It's normal to feel nervous. It's normal. 
And because of it, we actually produce cortisol on a daily basis. And this cortisol, what it does for us on a daily basis, it gets circulated around widespread, widespread target, so widespread. But it helps with several different things. It helps with tissue repair. It helps with tissue repair because sometimes when you uh, stump your toe and you were like, ha, 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 then, you know, but it's then going to need to heal, right? Or sometimes when you're running from that bear, you might not win, right? And, and you might get hurt. And so usually after times of some stressful event, we know, you, you know you're going to need something that's going to boost tissue repair and healing. And cortisol does it. We make a synthetic version of cortisol, what it, what it, and we give it as a, a drug. What is it? I, I don't hear. It, it, and actually, like prednisone is the one I was thinking of, but a lot of those things are, have a derivative of that. But prednisone, have y'all heard of prednisone? Mm -hmm. Prednisone. So, you know, we make it so we give that when we see people who have chronic disease, like that are going to need to have had some chronic kind of injury to, like, maybe. Maybe they have chronic respiratory disease, um, or you know, maybe they have had like something with their skin issues, <coughs> like poison ivy or whatever, and it's gotten where it's really affecting a huge margin. So they'll give you some prednisone, won't they? And it'll help with the tissue repair. You don't want to stay on it for long periods of time, though, because with cortisol and or synthetic pre uh, prednisone, cortisol. Um, it also influences electrolyte balance. So if you're trying for tissue repair, think if this doesn't make sense in times of stress, you also need to keep your, your blood pressure up so you end up having sometimes fluid imbalances when that cortisol levels are staying too high. You also can have other things like um, glucose imbalances because cortisol is going to end up causing you to actually make glucose. It, it initiates a process called glucose neogenesis. So glucose levels are going to, glu glucose neogenesis just means the genesis, the beginning of new glucose. So it's going to, and you're going to want that because the glucose is going to give you ATP. So this is why you need to be really careful when you have a patient who's had surgery, because is that an insult? Mm -hmm. Is that an injury? Is the body going to be producing cortisol? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you've had patients who've been through stressful things, and you see their blood glucose levels are high. Are you going to just automatically jump on the fact that they have diabetes mellitus? Mm -hmm. No, you're going to mm -hmm. think, well, wait a minute. This happens when they're stressed like this. This is going to be happening. The cortisol levels can actually cause that to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it may get high enough that you would have to treat, a, but hopefully it would be transient that you would have to treat, and then you would come off of it, you know, the treatment for that. Because it, it doesn't mean they're, they have diabetes mellitus. It's just that they've been grossly insulted. And the high cortisol levels and or prednisone that you gave them um, has thrown their glucose levels off. This makes it really, really tricky when someone has all that happened and they are a diabetic. Because now their glucose levels are really bad, aren't they? Uh, the glucose levels are really bad and it can make it kind of really tricky. Because you really do have to give prednisone sometimes to these people and um, it can make it difficult. Okay, so um, we have talked about aldosterone as one of those uh, corticosteroids, and we've talked about cortisol, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you about another one. They are called androgens. Androgens. These androgens are actually referred to as sex steroids, but let me tell you what you call them, and they're, they're just slightly different versions, or not even different, really, but these are called testosterone and estrogen. It's really estradiol, but whatever. It's, a, it's an estrogen. So where have you heard of testosterone and estrogen? Have you heard of them from the adrenal glands? From the adrenal glands, you've heard of those. Now, where do you usually think of testosterone coming from? The testes. Where do you usually think of estrogen coming from? But look at this. We have another set of glands, the adrenal glands, that give us these sex steroids, these estrogen and testosterone. 
So that tells you that men have estrogen, don't they? Where do they get it from? The adrenal glands. And that women have testosterone. And where do we get it from? The adrenal glands. And actually, it's a really good thing because, ladies, it is testosterone that gives us our libido. What does libido mean? Your sex drive. Your sex drive. It is testosterone. Gives libido. That gives the sex drive. And ladies, do we have nearly as much testosterone as men do? We do not. And it makes perfect sense that we don't. Because, ladies, we have a, a few hour window, and that's it, each month, that we can actually get pregnant. Just a few hour window each month that we can get pregnant. Where men have to be ready 24 7 in case they meet a woman that's in that little window. <laughs> so I want you to realize that that's the reason that men's sex drive really is so much higher. Than women's, that's a natural thing that it really is because they are on this 20. You have to almost say, Bless their hearts, they're on this 24 hour cycle of the sex hormones being secreted because they have to be ready 24 7 to keep life going on this in this place that we're in. Where women, we really don't have that kind of, of drive naturally. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know how y'all sex drive. It's normal to have a sex drive, isn't it? It's normal, but, and I don't know how y'all feel about your sex drive, but, and I don't want to know. Because <laughs> that's not my job. But, but here's what I want to, so, so don't even volunteer anything. But here's, here's what I want to I want to tell you though. Because I think most of us, after puberty, when all of that, that cyclic thing started kicking in, and you know, you started having these things that you think I'm gonna be going crazy, right? Or, or why am I so interested? Or, or, or what's going on? Can you talk when I'm around this person? Or you know, whatever, you're just distracted. Anyway, natural. <laughs> but if you if you think about when you are having a sex drive in the moment, you can feel a little crazy, can't you? Which I'll, what you, you get what I'm saying? Now imagine men. On the 24 hours, I don't know how they function. So, um, so anyway, I really don't. But that is actually true. True. That, I mean, it's physiology because they do have to be ready 24 seven, and we don't. And we do get our hormones from the adrenals. So, ladies, something also happens with women very different from men. After puberty, men are unless something happens to them, men are going to be fertile throughout their life if they live to be 102. They're going to be fertile, and they're going to have that cyclic. Now, it decreases a lot after a certain age or whatever, but it's still there on this 24-hour cycle. Where women, you know, we go through menopause, don't we? So uh, if we're lucky enough to get to live to be older, you, you, you know, you go through menopause. And so what happens in menopause is estrogen and uh, some of these other levels start to decrease, right? They really do start to decrease. And so that's, I was trying to go somewhere with this, but I forgot that. Okay, okay, now I know what I'm getting at too. But our estrogen levels from our ovaries start to decrease greatly, but we still get some from our where? Adrenal. Adrenals. So we're still getting some from our adrenal glands. Okay, um, any questions for me about that? What are those, the cortisol hormones, what is that target? Cortisol is really widespread. Okay. It's a widespread target. Yep. What about the androgens? Is that the gonads or the androgens? The androgens are widespread as well. It's you can have widespread effects from that. These um, sex steroids, you know, testosterone. We said had widespread effects. Secondary sexual characteristics. We know it does libido. Testosterone does libido too. Uh, secondary sexual characteristics in men. If women, now let me go ahead and give you, since you're asking this, let me give you, uh, let me give you a disorder where there's a hypersecretion of the sex steroids in infants, in gestation. <clears throat> now, hypersecretion means there's going to be too much of these sex steroids. This is called androgenital syndrome. Androgenital syndrome. I think some of the disorders are at the end of this chart, at the end of this thing, which really makes me. This is different from where I usually had them. Um, but anyway, um, I don't know. can I see a book again? Oh, wait, wait. Okay, one minute. Let's see. I feel like this is going Can I see a 
talk again to cover. I think it's in this or your new AGS, y'all writing down AGS, AGS, androgenital syndrome. Did you write it down? Um, Thank you. On page 661, it's this little black and white colored picture here. 661. Now I'll bring it back to you guys. 661. This little picture is showing you a uh, what you're looking at is someone holding the clitoris with their thumb and, and index finger of a baby that has been born. But that's the clitoris. It looks like a what? Looks like what? Penis. Looks like a penis, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not. And what has happened is because of this hyper secretion of testosterone, which from the adrenal glands in the fetus, the the external genitalia took on male looking characteristics, didn't they? The the labia, the lips, <laughs> the lips of the female fused. Because that's what they do in males. That's what forms the scrotal sac in response to testosterone. So this is a little girl. This is the genitalia of a little girl. But you could see where someone might be confused about that. Is this like Except they really wouldn't be. Because if you've ever seen a little boy, a baby boy scrotal sac or massive. <laughs> 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 They're massive. Uh, so, so you would know something was, if you knew anything. You would know something was wrong. Yeah. Is this a um, sex disorder then? Because this actually, the, the reason I'm thinking that is because there's that time and window where you can, where so you said there's the a SRYG yeah. determines gender, but this is unrelated to the oh. SRYG. This is about the adrenal glands. Okay. The adrenal glands are just pumping out. An excess amount of testosterone, okay. and if it's a if it's a female organism well, the body, then they're going to respond the same way that the male body respond male organism responds in response to testosterone from the SRY gene, or they can. So so this is called AGS in infancy. Now, by the way, this hypersecretion of these sex hormones, which is predominantly testosterone, can also happen in adult females. What do you think might be a sign of that in an adult female? If the onset happens in an adult female, what do you think the, the signs might be? The hair, like beard, facial hair. facial hair, beard, and chest hair, maybe even, you know, ab so that could be like, that could happen. But what else? The, it could be, a, it could, the voice could start to change. We might not see an obvious Adam's apple, but the voice could start to change. Would, they, would their breasts not be, would they be more flat chested? No, not necessarily, because, no, not necessarily with that, but they would start to see these, this, these indicators. Um, their sex drive might be go up, so that might be a good part. Okay, if you're looking for a silver lining. Okay, that was a joke, and nobody laughed. Okay, so anyway. Um, Maya, are you all right back there? Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> hypersecretion from the, Maya's looking back. Maya, you had a look on your face. Y'all think I don't look dark. But you had a look on your face when I just looked glanced at you that is so common for, for um, sometimes when you're hearing about these disorders, disorders, thinking, you know, God, there's just so much people can have. I just wish I didn't even know about all this. <laughs> 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 so look, you guys, it's all good. Is it still close? How do you feel like hypochondriacs a little bit? Do you, <laughs> do you feel like hypochondriacs? Is is AGS still called AGS when it does in adulthood? Yeah, yeah, because it's the androgen, and it can affect. It's still, it's not. It, it on a female woman. By the way, once a woman, if it's an onset in a female <coughs> adult woman, her labia are not going to fuse at that time. They're not going to do that. It can affect the clitoris some, though. So, um, but in a in a baby, you really do see like that clitoris is is huge, isn't it? I mean, it looks like penis, but the um, 
But that's the same tissue that becomes a penis and a, and a male. Those are the same tissues. It's just the effects of the hormones. Um, so anyway. So what do you do? If, yeah. Like, so what do you do? I don't know what you would even be able to do for a baby, but for a grown woman, would you? I have never really looked into like how an endocrinologist would approach it. Uh, and like what we thought, first you would probably try to rule out tumors because we said hypersecretions are often what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you would try to rule that. And then, uh, you know, certainly in babies, these babies can have some surgery, some, any babies that have what's called ambiguous genitalia. This isn't the only thing that can lead to ambiguous genitalia in an infant. Uh, there, there are dozens of disorders where babies can be born and you're just not quite sure from looking at the genitalia, male or female. And yeah, that's very traumatic for the parents too. Because, you know, that's the first thing people ask you. What do you have? You know? Um, like you just don't know for sure. But they can do surgical, some things, and then hormone replacements if replacements needed or, or therapies and other ways to try to um, – to correct these, but I don't know what the typical, what a typical type of treatment would be. Now, be interesting to know. For these babies, I don't, would they be able to reproduce? Would they still have like the reproductive it, I think it would depend on how severe, like some of the disorder had happened, because if this is happening, it could have also affected the development. We know that SRY gene completely affects different to, uh, duct development, mm -hmm. right? The ducts and the developing embryo. So I think it would depend on how severe it had happened. And again, reversal, trying to reverse some of these things. What most I have heard, and I don't know, I don't think this has changed. I think what, what most of the time now happens when these are usually caught early, because usually a lot of babies in developed countries are being born in facilities that would recognize this right away. And so what they do first is uh, karyotyping. And from the karyotyping, they're going to know genetically if this is male or female, right? If this should be male or female. And then they try to go by that. They try to treat and go by what the genetics are. There have been parents who have decided against that, and they wanted the other gender instead. And so they let parent. They in some cases, I know they let parents. <coughs> I don't understand that, but I think I remember the case you're talking about. Yeah, I don't Canada, understand. Right? I, I, it's been more than one case. It's and been like, several. And then they found the class because they yeah. felt like they were yeah. the opposite gender inside, right. but they there, were always like pressured to be that. That there is a um, this has happened more than one time, and so it's almost like maybe it's almost like children never have any rights, you know. Uh, it, which is the way it sounds, but at, okay. But just a quick thing: there's a book that's really worth reading. It's a true story, it, and uh, about an individual who's an adult now that went through similar something similar to this that the parents took. Uh, it's called Middlesex. The name of the book is Middlesex, but it's it's really worth reading. It's it's actually it just makes you really empathize um, with. You know, I, I think there are a lot of, don't you think there are a lot of people who get all bent up about, well, you were born a girl, you were born a boy. But guess what? In some cases, guess what? No, it's not that simple. It isn't. It isn't. And, you know, until you've walked in a person's shoes that's had to deal with that, um, you probably shouldn't get a say in it. What's Politicians. The okay. <laughs> What's the purpose of the adrenal glands at producing? Sex, sex, sex. What's steroids the if the if you have testes and ovaries? That's a really that's a really uh, good question that I certainly don't have the answer for. <laughs> other than to say that I would think it's an evolutionary uh, thing that has occurred. That you know we understand that there's this isn't the only case where you have more than one area that's producing a certain thing. So it's almost like not having all your baskets in one. <laughs> you have all your eggs in one basket. Um, because we do know that these play a role in other tissue things, as well, tissue developments as well. So, um, but I don't know why, if there's even any theories about why these organs have evolved the way that they have, because we know organs are still evolving. We know that we have some organs that don't even have functions anymore, but we know that once upon a time they did. And now they, so, so we're evolving. Life on the planet changes. It changes in response 
as to what I don't know if there are any theories out there about why we have some organs that kind of look like they're almost doing the same thing um, or providing some of the same things. Did you have a question, Kelly? I do. Um, kind of about the sex steroids as well. If women have estrogen and testosterone, do well, y'all have estrogen and testosterone? And men have estrogen, too. When a woman um, sexually peaks, is that like an increase of testosterone? Sexually like, peaks? Like, oh, you mean orgasm? No, like... Oh, I didn't know. Sorry. I just like didn't know. Like, time increases, like, oh. later, like, as they get older? Oh, 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 absolutely. And it's just absolutely what you, when you, it, whatever you might believe, you know, Allah, God, some mystic, something out there controlling the universe, they definitely have a sense of humor, right? So, as women, whatever it is out there, because as women get older, their sex drive does go up. And some of it is because estrogen, actually, high estrogen levels can depress the sex drive. You can depress it. So as the estrogen levels start to lower um, and testosterone levels start to be, you're more sensitive to the testosterone levels just because the estrogen levels have lowered, sex drive is going up. But there might not be too many men around who care about <laughs> your sex drive. So my, my friend believes that she had reached that point and she said that her boyfriend didn't give up. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different class. Like, that's just such a different class. Like, I was just wondering about the increase in testosterone and lowering. Benjamin Franklin had, I don't know if y'all ever read any of Benjamin Franklin's writings. Uh, he and Thomas Jefferson were, I mean, God, just so brilliant. Sort of like Christopher Hitchens in our day. Christopher Hitchens, brilliant. Anyway, um, Benjamin Franklin said he really loved older women, and one of the, he loved all women, but one of the things he talked about were older women, and just that, yeah, he understood. I don't think he understood it at a hormone level, but he understood it at a practical level. That meant, oh. <laughs> so he's got some very funny writings, and, um, you know, he's pretty risque, Benjamin mm -hmm. Franklin. Um, okay. All right, so we're back. Here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is the adrenal gland the only one that secretes one? Um, like, is that where you get your testosterone as a woman or your estrogen as a male? Is there any other glands that release Okay, that? It's, it's more complicated than I'm just telling y'all, and I love that how interested and in, that you guys have such inquiring minds. These hormones, if you look at those hormones, they are very, their molecular 3D structure is very, very similar. They're, they're very, very similar to each other, estrogen and testosterone. And even fat, even fat content can actually uh, increase some of, can change this and increase it. So um, increase one or the other. But we know like little boys at puberty. Have you ever known boys at puberty that get breast buds? Have y'all ever, they're called, it's called gynecomastia. Y'all might want to know that word. It's called gynecomastia. Gynecomastia means that it's breast development in males. Breast development in males. How many of you have seen uh, boys at puberty? They hit puberty and they have like breast buds. Their breasts become really sensitive, right? And this can be really, if, if a young boy has not been explained to that this can happen, can you imagine how frightening that would be? Uh, pretty much as frightening as it is for young girls who never get told that they'll start menstrual cycles and then all of a sudden start seeing blood, you know. Um, so anyway, but it's, it usually just, it's usually really transient and it will go away and it will resolve. It's just that the hormone levels are, are, are changing and their body tissues are being influenced by it and usually it's going to resolve itself within a certain period of time. Uh, you know, and it, in some, for some though, for some men, it can last a long time. Um, my son, I shouldn't tell things so much. No, 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 my sons haven't had that. They didn't have that. Um, they they would say how their nipples got sensitive. They would say, you know that, but um, they didn't have that. But my, I was going to tell you about my son who's in the Marines. Um, please don't name him. But. He had one of his best friends in the Marines still had gynecomastia. And so he's like a 20-year-old in the Marines with gynecomastia. And that's old. That's older for that to be lasting. And, you know, the Marines are like, um, 
I don't know, that's just a whole different mindset, those Marines. And so anyway, you know, so you've got this, this uh, his name's AJ, but AJ, I mean, he just looked, like you, you would not know this, but he was so self-conscious about it that they actually reduced them. They did, the Marines did, the government paid for it. Y'all paid for that, by the way. Uh, and so Jake was like, God, Mom, you should have seen what they did. They had these drain tubes in. I was like, yeah, welcome to female worlds, you guys. You know, we, we have to do these things too. So after they did the reduction, um, he, had, he had, you know, he said how painful it was and they put in drain tubes and, um, you know, just whatever. And like, yeah. That's what breasts are about, you know. Uh, but anyway, so AJ had that. It doesn't usually last that long, so it usually goes away. Have y'all had any experience with your brothers or boys or anybody? My oldest son was actually born like that. Oh, yeah. Apparently, I had too much estrogen. Did all babies, <laughs> did you know that babies, babies, most babies are born with little buds, little breast buds, males and females, but that's your hormones going through to them. Those were and huge, and they last way long time. Well, that, that's, <laughs> that meant you had plenty of that meant you had plenty of the hormones circulating. And the babies, did y'all know back in the day in some cultures, babies that were born with those, they sometimes would leak milk, and some of those babies were put to death for me because they were said to be witches. We've come a long way, haven't we? Yeah. I know, really, because all that is, it's very normal. If you, it, It's very normal for babies to have little what are called breast they, they call them. I don't know if anybody calls them breast but for me. No, no, I think everybody does, don't they? I don't know if I've ever heard that as a medical term, but y'all know what I'm saying when I say that. There's just this little swollen area. It looks like the areola, and just the areola is, is thickened. Do y'all know what I mean when I say that? Okay, whatever. Uh, but yeah, and so it's really common because you're getting, they're getting it through you, through your blood, it's going through the, um, well, it's diffusing across, and they're, and they're reacting to it. So, yeah. How long did it last? It was a couple of months, because I was freaking out, because I kept asking the pediatrician. I'm like, but this is normal. And I hope your pediatrician was saying, yes, it is. Oh, yeah. He was. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I hope your pediatrician was absolutely letting you know that that can be very normal. Um, all right. So the adrenal glands. Now, guys, I want to talk to you about the, the <coughs> pancreas. Um, and the pancreas, we know where it is, don't we? The pancreas is going to be slightly, that's a transverse section, which is a weird way to see it. But the pancreas is going to be slightly... Um, inferior and dorsal to the stomach. So the pancreas is actually going to, uh, the, so the stomach has been removed here. So the stomach is this J-shaped organ that's been removed from the first part of the small intestines. This is the first part of the small intestines. Are y'all seeing that? Mm -hmm. That this is the first part called the duodenum. And even the the rest of the small intestines have been removed for you. So you notice that the pancreas actually has a duct running throughout it that actually enter, that actually exits its secretions through, to the small intestines. Y'all see that, don't you? All right, so we know the pancreas is actually an endocrine and an exocrine gland. It's going to secrete its exocrine products into these ducts that end up going into the small intestines, helping with digestion and nutrition. So, yay for the pancreas. But what we're going to concentrate on right now is the pancreas's endocrine function. And I do want you to know that the beta islet cells, uh, the beta islet cells of the pancreas, if you took this tiny little square and you blew this little square up and looked at it on a histology slide, these beta cells in the, um, that are called beta islet cells, they produce insulin. And if you don't learn anything else in this chapter, please learn this. Insulin is going to decrease blood glucose levels. So what would be the stimulus for the release of it? When your blood glucose levels start to get high, your pancreas gets a signal to release insulin, which is then going to target widespread <coughs> out of your body, widespread, it is going to decrease blood glucose levels. I have actually told you all how it does it. How does it do it? By escorting glucose into a cell 
So your cells have to have what to recognize insulin? They have to have, all your cells need to have these protein doorways, receptors that recognize insulin. That's going to be necessary. And if insulin's out there, it's escorting a glucose molecule into the cell to be used for what? Energy. ATP formation. Energy. Okay, so that's great. That's one way it reduces blood glucose levels. What's another way? Insulin out in the bloodstream is also going to encourage glucose molecules to form a molecule called glycogen. And you do need to know that glycogen, glycogen is a storage form of glucose. Glycogen is a storage form. I hate these notes. I hate them. Nothing's anywhere. So glycogen is a storage form of glucose. <coughs> glycogen is actually going to uh, be sent to the liver and the muscles to be stored between meals. And then as, as your blood glucose levels start to get low, are you going to have to respond to it? Your body has to respond? And when your body has to respond to it, because blood glucose levels are now too low, you're going to end up producing a hormone from the pancreas, the alpha cells, called glucagon. These are from the alpha cells. They're called glucagon. It's called glucagon. This hormone <laughs> targets your storage molecule of glucose. What was that called? Glycogen. glycogen. And it breaks glycogen down. And as glycogen breaks down, we said it's made of monomers called glucose. And so your blood glucose levels start to rise. So if this was our negative feedback for glucose, this little chart right here is now we talk about glucose. What we know is blood glucose levels, blood glucose levels about <laughs> 70 to 100 or 110 um, micrograms per deciliter. So if you had, if you had blood, blood glucose levels rising, what are you making? Insulin. From which cells? The, the beta islet cells of the pancreas. And now blood glucose is going to start to do what? Go down. And when it gets to the low normal, what are you going to release? The alpha cells are going to release glucagon. What's it going to target? It's going to, it's going to target those, the glycogen molecules, breaking them down, breaking them down, and that blood glucose is going to go up. And you're going to do that until you eat your next meal, which if you're a real girl like mine, you'll have what in it? Sugar. Yeah. <laughs> you'll have something, well, the carbohydrate. Because glucose is carbohydrates, right? Um, how do y'all feel about that? Y'all feel like you would understand that inside and out? You understand that we have, we can give people insulin and glucagon as medications. Would you need to know just what you are doing to give them? Mm -hmm. Because you know that if you give them insulin, you better watch out carefully to what? A drop. You're going to watch carefully. Anytime someone's on insulin, more diabetics, diabetes mellitus patients, have died from hypoglycemia, which means what? Low sugar in the bloodstream. Anemia means in the bloodstream, doesn't it? So low blood, low blood glucose. More die from that than they do the high. So insulin is a serious drug. But if you're watching your patient's blood glucose and it starts to get low, you can give them what? Well, you can give them a cookie. If they're still awake, don't give them a cookie if they're in a coma, though, because they're going to choke and aspirate. So what are you going to give them? Glucagon. Glucagon, exactly. And then as soon as they start to rouse, you're going to give them. You're going to give them something. You're going to give them this orange juice with sugar in it or something. You're going to help try to get anything you can to get that glucose back up. Um, yes, yes. All right, so good. All right, y'all Y'all are going to know that. There's another hormone, too, uh, and this is actually called somatostatin. I don't ever ask you about this, but I, you know what this is? <laughs> this is a hormone that referees. <laughs> it really does. It kind of referees, but I mean, I'm not going to ask you about it. Because we said that glucose homeostasis isn't just from pancreatic secretions of insulin and glucagon. We know there's other things going on. Did human growth hormone affect blood glucose levels? Yes. And did, did we say that cortisol does? Yes. 
And so we have these other factors affecting blood glucose homeostasis and levels. And really, I sort of think of this hormone as action as kind of being a referee for it. Um, but I, I'm not going to ask you about it because I don't think you'll much hear about it. So hyperglycemic hormones that raise blood glucose concentrations, glucagon, growth hormone, epinephrine, norepinephrine, that fight or flight response, did you say? <laughs> So we understand that, and then the hypoglycemic hormones, insulin, insulin. Um, now, here's, here's what I need to talk to you about, and it's going to be, it's, it's uh, not a order, but I don't, I don't like that these new, these new things are putting the disorders away from them, and I do need to, um, I do need to go to that, because I want to tell you about it. Um, diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus. We said diabetes just means you're taking a lot of urine. But mellitus is going to be referring to um, glucose imbalances. Glucose imbalances. And there's two types of there's two types of well, there's more than two, but the two major types are called diabetes mellitus, insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, IDBM, IDBM. Insulin dependent diabetes mellitus used to be called juvenile diabetes. Y'all have heard of that, haven't you? And then the other second major, there's about 10% are fall into this category, about 10% of all diabetics, uh, we're talking about glucose, all diabetics fall into that first care category I just told you about, IDDM. And then we have a second category that's way by far and away the predominant one called non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. And I whatever the abbreviation is, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, N-I-B-U-L. Anyway, and that's about 90 plus percent. I think most medical professionals and I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure about it, but I think most would, are going to tell you that non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, the one that's onset when you're older, is behavioral and is preventable. Is that like type two? Yes, it's what they call type two. The other one that they call type one, this is called type two diabetes mellitus, is preventable. What do I mean preventable? What's causing it then? I it's behavioral, it's our diets, it's our lifestyle, it's not just diets, but it's also lifestyles. You know, it's, it's, there's so many contributing factors, there's not just one thing, there's a lot of contributing factors. There should not be stigma associated with it because that hinders um, treatment and being proactive. But the fact is, you know, we're living longer, uh, people are living longer than they ever did before, and people are developing this. Um, sometimes in older age, but this, this, the alarming thing about diabetes mellitus type 2 uh, is that we can't, that we have any children being diagnosed with it now. And this is one of the reasons we can't say juvenile onset diabetes for type 1, because we have juvenile onset diabetes now for type 2. Uh, but what we do know for most, not all, cases, for most, not, but not all cases, if behavior changes with diet, weight loss, activity levels, you can usually go off of medication. But listen to what I'm saying. There's no cure. Once a child has been diagnosed, or a person has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, the goal is to get them manageable and off medications and behaviors and lifestyle changes, but they still have the disease. They still have some of the consequences that, that, that are going to be associated with the disease. So that is the goal, but you would realize that they are forever more going to have that disease. Um, so really to be proactive in medicine is to try to prevent the onset of type 2 diabetes. We, every one of us, know and love somebody, or might even ourselves, have type 2 diabetes, don't we? No, it's so common. Type nicotine disorders, from nicotine smoking and related disorders, and diabetes type 2, mellitus type 2, drive most of the health care costs in this country. That's where most of the costs are coming from. 
So they're really serious things, aren't they? And when you look at that, you think both of those things are what? Theoretically, are preventable. Theoretically, are pre I mean, theoretically, I say theoretically because is it easy to change the lifestyle? No. If y'all figure out an easy way to change your lifestyle, you're going to share it with me, aren't you? You're going to share it with me? It isn't easy. I, you know, I'm trying to make it. But, but it's not easy. It's really hard, isn't it? It's really hard. It's really hard. How many of you know somebody with type 2 diabetes that will, um, that maybe has even progressed now that takes insulin, that will uh, take insulin and then eat that big piece of chocolate cake or eat that dessert or do How many of you know people? You? you don't know anybody that does that? Thank you, Maya. I do too. I know a lot of them that do that. I know people who have uh, fourth stage lung cancer from being smokers all their life, but they still will unplug that oxygen and they'll go out and they'll do what? It's hard to change lifestyle. It is hard. That is easier said than done. And so, what is the answer, do you think, to help going forward? Start a healthy lifestyle. Yes. Educate our young people as they're coming up to not form habits, because what do we say? It takes um, 21 days to break a bad habit, but only three to get one. And so this is why they talk about this over-prescribed pain medicines too, saying you shouldn't stay on it longer than three days. Well, no, you shouldn't have been put on. You shouldn't have been written, written strict for it. Um, so, but anyway, um, it doesn't take long. We're, we're animals and we have this physiology and we have all this complex chemistry. And it doesn't take long for us to get into things that can make us feel good that we want to keep repeating, right? So the answer is edu early education and the answer is to try to be proactive and to prevent, um, prevent things before they happen instead of react after they happen. And to also be supportive because there should never be stigma associated with anything that someone has, whether it is an addiction, whether it is a, there, sh there shouldn't be stigma. And there, there are, there is a lot of stigma because we're humans, but we, we really try to not have that. Okay, so, so I want you to know some of this terminology, polyuria, polythasia, um, polydipsia, and so the, the definitions are here. Make sure you would know them. You, you, if you broke these words down, break them down. Because prefix is always going to mean the same thing. Root words and suffixes, I tell you over and over. So once you get it, things become easier. Um, but anyway, so why do you think you're having your, an excess urine output? Why would that be? Because you have such hyperglycemia, high blood glucose. And everybody just listen to me. If you don't have to, just listen to me and see if this makes sense. If you have a lot of glucose in your blood plasma circulating around, would it change the osmolarity of your blood plasma? Yeah. It would, and I, I could give you all a definition for osmolarity, meaning the percentage of solids in the liquid. It means you have these big, and, and glucose molecule is pretty big on molecule, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it's changing the osmolarity of that. And if you've got so much filtering through the kidneys and so much glucose is filling into the filtrate, is it changing the osmolarity of that filtrate? Mm -hmm. It is. And water <coughs> follows it. Water's going to follow it. Is glucose in your urine ever a normal finding? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. So when you are spilling the glucose, water is following it and you're peeing all the time, right? Well, not all the time, literally, but you know what I'm saying. So you have an excess of urine. That's, just, that's what this means. Um, and with that excess of urine, your body's going to be, uh, you're going to be a little bit dehydrated. So what is your body going to be telling you? To so say you're thirsty. And that's a normal, you know, because you're dehydrated. By the time you have a sense of thirst, you're already hypovolemic. What does hypovolemic mean? Write that down, hypovolemic. That's what's a V. A V is a victor. I've had I've seen people's quizzes come back and I think, oh, you know, what is volemia? It's a V, it's a victor. Hypovolemia. Hypovolemia means low volume in the bloodstream. Hypovolemic shock is the most common type of shock. It is the most common type of shock. 
and one of the most common causes of hypovolemic medical shock that kills people is dehydration. If that's not the saddest thing you hear today, I'm going to feel sorry for you because that's pretty darn sad. Because what could save those lives? Just simply doing what? Mm -hmm. Hydrating them back. Getting them hydration. IVs if you have to. You know what I mean? <laughs> Number one cause of death in kids under five. Hypovolemic shock due to dehydration. dehydration. That, is, that is a sad, sad thing to hear. So, so that's why you're thirsty. And you... You also feel hungry because your body's not using, uh, your, your body is not able to use glucose for energy. So your body is first having to store it as fat, then converting it to a usable form of energy, then putting off as you're burning the fats, ketones, then your pH is thrown off, and it's like to hell in a handbasket. Are you hearing me? So it throws a lot of different things off, including pH. So this is what is going on with that. How do you feel about some of that? You feel, you know, there's some. Now, what is happening with this is, um, and you can see some of this, but what is happening with this is that, uh, is that your blood glucose levels aren't staying in homeostasis. So you do need to know this part. The reason this becomes a problem is that when the blood glucose level stays too high for too long, it's neurotoxic. And what does neurotoxic mean? It's a poison to your nervous system. This is why chronic diabetics that are brittle have neuropathies. What are neuropathies mean? Diseases of the nervous tissue and nervous system. They will have tingling and pain in their feet or numbness, one or the other, or all of them at any different time. You know what I'm saying? in their extremities, right? So they will have these neuropathies. But not only that, because <coughs> the neurons end up affecting other tissues as well, like the blood vessels even are going to be influenced by this, they're going to have, start to have vascular disease. And the vascular disease is going to put a stress on the kidneys. If you've ever known anybody who was on renal dialysis, which just means what? You're having to take the blood out of the person, filter it, put it back in because their kidneys aren't filtering. If you've ever known anybody with renal dialysis, a big bet that would, I would win is that most of them have been because of complications of what? Diabetes. Lots of complications. Because of the vascular complications, tissues, especially extremities, aren't getting good blood supply. If they're not getting good blood supply, tissues will what? Yeah. Die. If they die, that sets them up for an infection from a bacteria that causes what? Gangrene. Right. Gangrene. And then you have to do what? Amputation. So is amputation a part of this disease? Can it be part of this disease? It's not treated. So that bacterium is called Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium is a genus. You would want to know this. Perfringens. Perfringens is the species name. This bacterium is everywhere. It's actually in our colon. So it's everywhere in the environment. This is part of our microbial world, this bacterium. It's not like we can just get rid of this bacterium. It's part of our world. Does it cause most of us any problem ever? Yeah. No. No, if you're healthy, this causes us no problem. But if you've got some dead tissue happening because of lack of circulation or enough circulation, then can this bacterium start to use that dead tissue as its food source? Yeah. It can. And it's, it, it causes a disorder called gas green, and that's going to have to be amputated. Hey, wait a minute. Can you just amputate the dead part? No, because no, it would still be there. So you have to amputate into the what? Into the healthy tissue. You've got to. All right. So, so we know that type 1 diabetes, uh, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, is an autoimmune disease. I do want you all to know that is an autoimmune disease. I, I always feel like it should be called a different name because it's so different than type 2. But, but many of the same um, 
symptoms, signs, symptoms, and potential devastation um, <laughs> happens to them, so whatever. Um, but type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and it was called juvenile onset diabetes for a really long time because most diagnoses do come early, like even before puberty. <clears throat> But some come, you know, as early as the, as late as the mid as the early twenties. So I see some people with that get diagnosed with type one diabetes as like early twenties. Like I had a couple of college students that get the diagnosis. They don't have any of the pre existing conditions. It is truly type one diabetes. It is truly the autoimmune disease onset. But many y'all y'all know people with type one diabetes. Yeah. You know, and usually, I mean, they can be little, three, four, five years old. Was diagnosed too. You know what? My uncle was like in the late sixties. So he so great then. His I daughter mean, was diagnosed in her senior year of college. Yeah. So you know, um, that's really great that he did that well during that age because we've got better at it now. You know, but um, but absolutely because there can be such such complications from this because it is really, you're not making insulin at all. In type one, and I need to tell you this, in type one, your immune system attacks the beta islet cells and destroys them, so you stop making insulin, essentially. The newest research, which is really exciting for type one diabetics, is that they're thinking that there's some precursor stem cells still behind, left behind, and if they can get them to regenerate, but fool the immune system not to destroy those. That's that's like one of the newest <coughs> things out there that they're trying to get a cure in type one diabetics. In type two diabetes, completely different thing. Type two diabetics are making plenty of insulin. They make plenty of insulin. It's just that they've made so much insulin because of their behaviors. You know, high carbohydrate, high carbohydrate meals, and and not active enough and overweight, that their cells have stopped responding to their insulin. So type two diabetics, their cells are insensitive to insulin. So are we gonna treat them with insulin? No. No, only when they become so bad that you're just throwing even that at them. But no, because they produce a ton of insulin. The treatments for type two diabetes are gonna be treating the receptors on the cells. They're going to be treating the precursor cells to try to keep that insulin out there longer. So, you know, they're going to be doing some of that so they have different modes. They're going to be targeting the kidneys to, so that you spill even more glucose, which means that you're going to be at a really high, if, if that's the medication you get as a type 2 diabetic, what are you going to be very careful about? Yes, yes, hypovolemic shock. So there's different medications for type 2 diabetics trying to target different things, but it's very different causes for each of those. We're good? Okay. All right. Now, um, are we finished? Lord have mercy. Okay, wait a minute. <coughs> Sorry. All right, we, we, we kind of almost started. We have the gonads, don't we? Yes. Don't act like you're not excited about the gonads. I know you are. <laughs> All right, so the only thing we're really kind of going to do about the gonads, where are the gonads? Okay, let's see. I mean, I know where they are in a person. But okay, <laughs> I, I do know where they are in a person, I swear. Uh, but, but what I want you to see about the gonads is that um, the gonads and um, this, you know, female uterus, you've got the, the fallopian tubes, or the polyurin tubes, and then these little ovaries that are blue for you here show. And then you can see the cadaver. Y'all see the cadaver pictures here um, and some illustrations <coughs> and whatnot. But so, anyway, I want you to know you know about from the pituitary, you have FSH and LH, that the onset of those start at puberty. The onset of those secretions start at puberty. And this is what causes all those things that you see happening at puberty to little girls and little boys, right? Yes. You see all these changes that are occurring over a couple year period window there, and you think, oh, oh, that, you know, there's a lot going on in their little heads and minds and bodies and all oh, those things. Um, and it is going to be because it's going to be because FSH and LA have targeted. 
Uh, can y'all hold on a second? Can we take a 10 minute break? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can we take, uh, sorry, let's do, can we do that? All right, okay, guys, y'all. Let's, let's go ahead. Um, talking about in, um, in Italy, how kids aren't, did you read that article? 300 students weren't allowed to go to school because they weren't vaccinated. Oh, uh, uh, and where was this? Italy. That's also happening in New York City, America, <laughs> USA, where they're not, the, the, the judge has said that the, the my parents, that did you read that today? The, the judge, because the, the judge told them they can't suing. go. Yeah, the parents were suing, the unvaccinated parents were suing the state. The That's judge was like, too bad. Too bad. Don't bring them. Uh, it's so very contagious, you know, and um, just not fair. So, I I mean, I don't know. What did y'all think? Were y'all thinking that was bad? Um, yeah, but, I mean, you know, if rather even being pro or con, you know, it, just this whole idea of, say, of protecting the people. It's not even just protecting the individual. Um, it's protecting people in your community that can't get vaccines. Yeah. Um, and that could die are more likely to die <laughs> from the illness because of their, their compromised state. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's becoming time for you to go. And I didn't hear the Italy thing. So there were 300. Yeah, that was like last week. Okay. I feel like it was a very good Tuesday is the week. Okay, so so I apologize for running out like that. We are about at the end of this. And so what I wanted to let you know though is that um, the ovaries get get targeted by FSH to, for <coughs> of the eggs and LH for ovulation. You know that. But what I would want you to get here before we even because we'll have a whole chapter on reproduction. So we're going to come visit these organs again. Uh, you know, it's the last thing we do this session actually is reproduction. But what I do want you to know about the ovaries themselves is that um, in the ovaries, and again, I'm, I'm going back to my old pictures, in the ovaries, in the ovaries, you have all the primordial follicles that you're ever going to have at birth as a female. And that follicle that gets targeted after puberty, one, it's usually one follicle gets targeted. Now, some women have two, have a follicle on, in each ovary get targeted, and what are they going to have a higher chance of having? Twins. Twins, right? So some women have that. But usually, the ovaries are going to alternate because the follicle that gets targeted this month is going to be nourishing that. It's going to rupture and release the egg, and then it's going to actually kind of close back up and become an endocrine organ all itself for a little while. That follicle becomes what's called the cor corpus luteum. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of that, the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is going to, uh, which is what's the follicle, is going to, if you get pregnant, that within two weeks, if you get implantation in the uterus, that corpus luteum is going to continue to secrete hormones to sustain the pregnancy in the first trimester. So the corpus luteum is the follicle, right, that released. If you get pregnant, if you get implantation happening that month, the corpus luteum stays and starts producing progesterone and estrogen, estrogen at pretty significant levels to sustain the pregnancy in the first trimester. So what do you think might be a problem for people who have recurring loss of pregnancies in the first trimester? What might be a problem? The corpus luteum is not closing. And it's a very, that's usually it. That's usually the problem. The corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is not releasing its hormones to sustain the pregnancy. So if they figure that out by doing the hormone checks, then they can actually just supplement that. Because after the first trimester, the placenta in the uterus is taking over sustaining the pregnancy. So the first trimester is sustained by that corpus luteum, which looks like on ultrasound a fluid-filled sac. What do you all call a fluid-filled sac? This, this is why when people have their radiology <coughs> techs do these ultrasounds and they tell a woman that she has an ovarian cyst, guess what? We all have ovarian cysts, one a month. <laughs> you know, we do. Um, 
And it's okay. It, it looks like that, a fluid pill sac. It does. Now, sometimes there are issues. And sometimes they stay longer than they should. And sometimes they can cause discomfort and whatnot. But, but we all have those. It's called corpus luteum. And it's normal. And if you have implantation uh, in that month of that monthly cycle, that corpus luteum is going to stay and sustain that pregnancy. Are you are you good with that? So the, that's really the only thing I'm introducing with ovaries right now. Testes, testes we said are going to be targeted by FSH, so that sperm will be produced. And testes also have very special cells, interstitial cells that are going to be targeted by luteinizing hormone that is going to cause the production of testosterone. And so um, the testes give, a, give testosterone, don't they, and sperm. So the, at puberty, with the onset of FSH and LH, is when the young males will start producing viable or living uh, sperm. And that's considered the onset of puberty in males. Males will have ejaculations before then, but it, they will have those before then that have some, um, you know, semen, but there's no viable sperm in them. But once the viable sperm starts being present, that's the onset of puberty for males. Okay, any questions for me about that? Now, we kind of finished our 10 organs. Do y'all feel really good about your 10 organs? I hope you feel pretty good about those 10 major organs. They're going to be your lab two in here. Now, that will not be Tuesday, will it? But, but it will be soon after that. Okay, so, but anyways, 10. Are you going to be able to label us get a 100? That's easy, right? Please, no. Look at a lot of different pictures. Um, you would want to be able to get a 100 on that. Now, I have hinted to you all that there's way more cells, tissues, and organs that produce hormones than just these 10. Hannah. Yeah, I told y'all that, and, and what we know is all the organ systems we're going to study from this point on in this session, we're going to be talking about the hormones that those organs actually produce. So are you going to be adding to your list of hormones? You're going to be adding to your list of hormones as we go. But for right now, there are a few I want to introduce you to now so that you have them. You ready? All right. Cool. Cool. Hey, guys. I want you to know the liver produces, and I, you can't go completely by these notes because I'm going to do this a little differently for you. That will help you when you get to clinicals. And, and I'm not taking too many liberties. I'm telling you what you need to know. I really am. Um, the liver produces, the one I want you to know from the liver is going to be uh, called, and I think it's not enough. okay, the one I want you to know from the liver really is not up here. Okay, it's called, it's called thrombopoietin. Thrombo. So instead of erythro here, I want you to put, don't even write this one down for the liver, right? Thrombo, T-H-R-O-B-O, -O, thrombopoietin. And what I want you to know thrombopoietin does from the liver is that it targets the red bone marrow. So it's going to go to the red bone marrow. And the stem cells in the red bone marrow are going to be targeted to become thrombocytes. So thrombopoietin, a hormone from the liver, targets stem cells in the bone marrow, red bone marrow, to become thrombocytes. Are we good? I want you all to know what thrombocytes are typically called. Does anybody know what they're typically called? They're called platelets. Have you ever heard of platelets? Mm -hmm. The real name for platelets are thrombocytes. Okay, so everybody write that down? Mm -hmm. All right, what do y'all know platelets have a function in? Blood clotting. So what, <laughs> what might be the first sign of liver disease? Not clotting. Not clotting. Or clotting too much. It, it's not clotting usually, and it's not clotting, and that means you're probably doing what easily? Bruising. Bruising. So the, one of the first signs of liver disease, even before you start to look yellow, can be that you're having some clotting issues. You're bruising more easily. There can be some issues with that, right? That makes perfect sense because the liver gives us thrombopoietin that ends up giving us platelets, thrombocytes, 
and from sites end up secreting clotting factors that help us with clotting. <laughs> Are we good? The liver contributes to another hormone I want to introduce you to right now, but it's not just the liver, but I do want you to know the liver contributes to it. The liver, it's also the kidneys contribute to this and the lungs, but this, these little precursor molecules get to a, a hormone called angiotensin. Now, what you've got right up here is angiotensinogen, which is just the beginning of it. But I don't need, need you to even know that. I just want you to know that the liver contributes to a hormone called angiotensin. And here's what I want you to know about this hormone. Its target is going to be the smooth muscles of vessels, blood vessels. That's its target. And what do you think it's going to do to those smooth muscles? It's going to constrict them. Angiotensin is the most powerful vasoconstrictor we produce in our bodies. If something is constricting your blood vessels, what's it doing to your blood pressure? Raising it. So here's another hormone that raises blood pressure. Raises blood pressure. What is hypertension? If somebody has high blood pressure, you told me one of the first ways you treat them is to give them a diuretic. Because that's going to make them what? Pee. And where is that order coming from? The blood volume. It's coming from the blood volume. And if the blood volume is going down, what's happening to your blood pressure? It's going down. Going down. The second thing you're going to think about treating them with, if that does, is doing it, is, an, is um, blocking angiotensin. Blocking. Because <laughs> if you're blocking their natural angiotensin, that's going to do what? It's going to, help to, it's going to help to lower it. Are you good with that? <clears throat> All right. That makes sense, right? Because you know what those things do. All right. I do say that a lot. All right. Uh, oh, look, I know. I really do. Okay. So, look. Here's what I want you to know. This is a heart. And I want you to know that the heart actually releases. The heart actually. Oh, God. I am throwing these. I'm throwing this powerful away. The heart actually releases something called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin. And here it is right here. Now, the heart gives us most of it. It's like 85%. Yes, the liver gives some. But only a little. So if you answer, where does, where does erythropoietin, y'all wait, wait, stop, stop, stop. I'm not talking about the heart yet. See this, I need a break. Y'all think it's hard to sit here and listen to me? It's, it's maybe a little hard for me to be talking to. No, okay, sorry, forgive me, forgive me a minute. I'm talking about the heart, so don't write down erythropoietin. That's not even true, I was just looking at it. The heart, see, it's everybody's script for that. Out. <laughs> heart doesn't do the erythropoietin. No, it doesn't, the kidneys do. But, but erase or your part. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the heart. The heart releases something called atrial natriuretic peptide or factor. So sometimes it's called A and F, and sometimes you'll see it referred to as A and P, but it's atrial natriuretic factor or peptide, which just means it's a protein hormone. But our hormones are either going to be lipid-based or protein-based, and I know y'all don't care too much about what, which one's which, but, but it, it doesn't even matter too much. But I just want y'all to know that the heart releases A, N, F, atrial. You guys, does anybody know what the upper chambers of the heart are called? Atria. The atria. Singular atria. Right atria, left atrium, atria. Right? Atrial. Dentritic. Natrium. Does anybody know what natrium is? Natrium. It's a Latin word. It's abbreviated N-A. It's sodium. Sodium. Natrium is sodium. Atrial natriuretic peptide or factor. Let me tell you where this hormone from the heart, from the heart, will target. It will target the kidneys. It targets the kidneys. And when it gets to the kidneys, it's going to cause sodium to be lost to the urine, to the filtrate, to the urine, to be lost. And when sodium is lost, what follows sodium? Water. Water. 
So what's happening to blood volume? It's decreasing. It's decreasing. And so what's happening to blood pressure? It's decreasing. So A and F from the heart targets the kidneys to lower <laughs> blood pressure. That is exactly the opposite of what aldosterone did. Do y'all see that? That's exactly the opposite of what aldosterone did. What'd you say? Antagonistic. So it's antagonistic to aldosterone. It absolutely is. You see, you see that, Kelly? Because it's doing the exact opposite thing. And we're glad we have something to do the raising and the lowering, right? So it does the opposite. So great. Now look, now I'm at the kidneys. Sorry, and I apologize to you for that from before. But I'm at the kidneys. I'm at the kidneys here, and you see where the little green kidneys are. EPO is an abbreviation for erythropoietin. It's an EPO is an abbreviation for C for erythropoietin. The kidneys give us 85% of our erythropoietin. A little bit comes from the liver, but that's not where I want you to know it's from because most of it comes from our kidneys. Our kidneys. Now, let me tell you what erythropoietin is. Does anybody know what erythro as a prefix means all the time? Erythema, er erythro. It means what? Red. It means red. So erythropoietin is a hormone that's going to help you to make red blood cells, which are called erythrocytes. That's exactly right. Where is the hormone coming from? And where does it target? Red bone marrow, where the stem cells are found for blood. And now if the stem cell encounters erythropoietin, what will that stem cell mature into? A red blood cell. What do red blood cells function? What's their function? Carry oxygen. So what will your oxygen levels do in your bloodstream? It was because of erythropoietin. It will go up. You might be thinking to yourself, well, why does kidneys, what do the kidneys have to do with that? What do the kidneys have to do with that? Well, what a better place to monitor your blood oxygen levels at a place where blood is being what? Filtered. Filtered. It's a perfect site. The liver filters too. So the liver does secrete some erythropoietin too, but it's the kidneys that give us our major, our major erythropoietin. So please listen to me when I say this, because we could go back and, and we could have hindsight 2020 with so many of our geriatric patients that lose their kidney function. Way before they lose their kidney function, which means urine output or any of those things that are happening because of that, guess what if you look back in their charts you would see? Well, yeah, that, that's because they don't have that. You're going to see that their red blood cell counts are low. They're going to be anemic. They will have had issues with anemia. Anemia, write that down, A-N-E-M-I-A. -E anemia means a low red blood cell count. A low red blood cell count. And to get red blood cells, what hormone do we have to be having secreted? erythropoietin and it's mostly coming from our kidneys and if you're going into kidney failure one of the first signs is anemia when somebody is anemic now by the way many of you are sitting there and thinking i've been told about anemia but my kidney's failing no not like you're, there are a lot of there are so many things that can lead to anemia so many things but kidney failure is one of them and you do need to be aware of it, right? Most of the time, in young people, it's diet. They're not getting enough iron or uh, copper or vitamin B12 complexes or whatever. It's just diet, lack of um, a proper nutrition. So uh, anyway, are you good with that? So kidneys are pointed. Now we're going to add to our list even as we go on. This renin, you don't have to write this down, but renin is a precursor hormone that helps with angiotensin. But, but that doesn't matter. I do want you to know right now the kidney cell, two hormones, erythropoietin and calcitriol. Y'all have already had calcitriol for me. Do you remember it? Mm -hmm. Calcitriol from the kidneys are, is going to end up targeting skin, really, and that's going to help when, with sunlight to make what? Mm -mm. Vitamin D. And with vitamin D, you're going to end up getting increased levels of absorption of, of um, 
calcium. So this is going to raise blood calcium levels. That's its function, raising blood calcium levels. How are you feeling? Feeling okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's just like so good, these hormones. <laughs> they, they're ruling your world and rocking out. We're not going to do them all right here, but we'll, because we'll get to these <coughs> organ systems. The only other thing I really wanted to tell you all about is going to be, and then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about hormone disorders that I haven't gotten to on, um, on Tuesday. But the only other thing I kind of wanted to tell you about is, let me see if I can get to a slide. Well, while I'm here, let me show you this. Does it make sense to you that as hormones are being released and they get to their target cells, the receptors have to be there? Mm -hmm. The receptors have to be working. The hormones are going to be received. And, and depending on the hormone, this cell itself will put even more receptors out so that re response is going up. So this is called an upregulation kind of response. This is, this is a perfect picture to show you um, to explain to you what happens in type 2 diabetes. Because in type 2 diabetes, now this is a normal occurrence that happens in down regulation where the cells start pulling the receptors off so the response is lower. This is a normal situation that should be happening all the time, but it can become uh, abnormal in cases like type 2 diabetes. Because in type 2 diabetes, there's been so much insulin out there for so long that your cells are staying in what? They're staying in down regulation and they're becoming insensitive to it out there. Do you get what I'm saying? So some disorders of the endocrine system are all about these receptors, aren't they? And not about the, the level of the hormone, about the receptors. But so that was just one of the visuals I wanted you to see. I had talked to y'all about these, some of these synergistic versus antagonistic. And maybe I had also what? And maybe I would also talk to you, um, you know, what, what, okay. No, I, I think, I think maybe that's just it for today. Yeah. Okay. That's good for today. That's <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah, there are going to be some I'm disorders. There are going to be some disorders that I haven't gone over that might still be in your thing, though. So that's going to mess you up a little bit. Um, but can I tell you all what I want to do, too? And, and we'll be done by one. But or even before then, I do want you've got your little names kind of printed on these. Um, but what I really wanted to do was to go. I got a handout for you, and let me tell you what it looks like. Um, it's a, and I'm, I'm gonna give it to you. You don't have to start it today. I'd rather you do this concept now with your group, and y'all really discuss it. But I'm, I've got a handout for you to take with you. That is like a chart. It's a chart table. And it's, it goes across, you've got the hormone name, the origin as a column, the target as a column, and the function there. But on this chart, you're going to see, I've got to go get a printer. Um, I've already seen it the printer. You're going to see that you're not given all the information. Like on one, you might be given a hormone, but you have to fill in where is it from, where is it targeting, and what does it do with. On this next one, you might be given the origin, so the organ, and you might be given the function, but should that make you know what the hormone is and where it's targeting? So it's, it's really an exercise that you all could use to just test yourself. I used to get it as a test, but now I'm giving it to you so that you can see how well you feel about it, but then use it as a what? Okay. And by the way, I'm giving you, telling you right now, it's not complete. You're going to have more than I'm giving you on this. It's going to be a whole thing, but it's, it's going to have a lot of them. But it's not complete. And it's also not based on, you know, all the pituitary ones together, all the thyroid ones together, all the adrenal ones together. Because if I were really using it as a study guide, I would make my own table, and I would like the table I'm about to give you to test yourself, but I would do it in an organized way, you know, I wouldn't do it in an all over the place way, but it's a way for you to test yourself and kind of know and be thinking to yourself, I really do need to know their names, where they're from, where they target, if it's specific, sometimes it's widespread and you just put widespread and what they're doing. Okay, I'm gonna go get it. Y'all give me these. Oh, yeah. She's like, don't. Right. Yeah, I I'll, I'll turn it in yeah, for y'all if you want. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. And then I have to sign. 
Um, so if y'all want to give me these, I'm gonna y'all can come up and get your little things and do your concept map, play with it, and try to do more of it today. And I'll be right back with your charts. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. By the way, this always fills up the class. Oh, I'm sorry, and we haven't had that. It's just in pencil. Can you see that?